So, good evening, welcome to the ZDW, uh, welcome to our new ZDW book talk. And I'm extremely happy and glad to have Philip Aguillon as our speaker tonight. Philip, nice to see you. Uh, welcome, at least online, at Mannheim. Uh, his new book is The Power of Creative Destruction, written jointly with Céline Antonin and Simon Bunel. And it's a fascinating book. It's a thick book, yeah, you have to read through it, but it's, it really makes a, a theory around uh, and, and empirics, a lot of empirics around creative destruction, kind of what is productivity in our society. And he will introduce a book, but let me first introduce him. Uh, Philip is a um, leading economist in the field of endogenous growth theory. Um, his work with um, Howitt is a fundamental work in that literature. And why it's called endogenous? Because it's innovation which drives growth. And that, I would say, is a topic you know, all your, of your whole academic life, uh, innovations by humans which drives growth. He's famous for both his theoretical work and also his empirical work. For example, his paper on uh, innovation and competition, the inverted U relationship, really changed the literature and the many papers followed that paper. I actually, when I was trained as an economist, I was trained as in contract theory and he also has great work together with Jean Tirole um, on uh, formal and real authority in organizations and with Patrick Bolton on incomplete contracts and financial contracting and many other papers also in that field. And that really is fascinating with Philippe Aguillon. He is both macroeconomist and microeconomist. He does both theory and empirics and all on the highest level. So he was professor in London at the UCL in Harvard and now he's back to Paris at the Collège de France got several honorary doctorates, pres uh, several prestigious prizes, so uh, an impressive academic career. But it's not just, you know, the academic career, he's also a consultant um, and uh, a policy consultant. He gives policy advice and he is uh, a consultant to Macron, the current French president. So I guess everything about French economic policy is partly up to you. I have some questions on that later on. <laughs> uh, but the uh, list. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, impressive and it's nice to have you back um, in <laughs> Europe. Um, he wrote this book and actually there seems to be a, a French uh, thing at the moment because uh, some years ago Thomas Piketty wrote his book uh, about, you know, inequality and Thomas was here. He gave a talk at the ZDW, Thomas yeah. Piketty. And now you have uh, the book about creative destruction and it's more about growth and productivity. And so, you know, uh, how well do, do you go on with Thomas? That would be my first question. But anyway, we will start with present with your book. And again, thanks for joining. It's great to have you here. And please start with the presentation of your book, Philip. Thank you very much. So thanks so much uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's great to be here. You know, uh, I've been several times to Mannheim. Uh, you know, I, I, we're talking about Martin Helwig and uh, Elu, his very close friend. And, uh, you know, I have uh, Elu van Taden. And, uh, and, you know, I've been several times in Mannheim. And so well, it's, well, it's close, close to my heart. Well, uh, OK, so let me, uh, let me share screen. Uh, and uh, voilà, let me just uh, go there. Voilà. And uh, uh, let me just go to slideshow. Voilà. Yes. Right. Voilà. Okay, here we go. Good. So, uh, so the, this book, uh, as you as was well <laughs> explained, so Power of Creative Destruction was joined with Céline Antonin and Simon Bunel. And in fact, it came out of uh, five years of teaching at Collège de France in Paris. And at Collège de France, you have to teach the public at large. So those are public lectures anybody can attend. So you have to show frontier research to non-specialized audience. And so uh, the research itself, it's more than 30 years of research on the economics of creative destruction, since I worked uh, in 87 on the first paper with Peter Howitt, and then we developed, and then there were other people who developed the approach. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, it's the last five years of teaching at college uh, on the material that we accumulated over the past 30 years that led to the book. Uh, um, okay, so now let me, uh, oops, uh, now I have a problem there. Oh, well, uh, creative destruction is the process whereby new innovations displace old technologies, make old technologies obsolete. 
And so this concept was introduced by Joseph Schumpeter, okay? Uh, uh, but in fact, there was no model. I mean, uh, there was this idea, which was brilliant, but there was no model uh, uh, of growth based on creative destruction, and there was no empirics. Um, so, so what we did with Peter Howitt is to build a, a, a new model, which now we refer to as the Schumpeterian growth paradigm, very much based on the following three ideas. Long-run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation. Each innovator builds upon on the giant shoulders of her predecessor. Okay. Second, innovations do not come from heaven. They result from entrepreneurial activities motivated by the prospect of innovation rights. And three, uh, creative destruction, new innovation displays all technologies. And you see what's very interesting is that, that in this theory, you have a contradiction at the heart of the growth process, because on the one hand, you need the, the innovation rights to motivate innovators, to pursue them. Uh, but on the other hand, they are very tempted to use those rights to prevent subsequent innovation and to block new entry because they don't want themselves to be victim of, of subsequent creative destruction from someone that would say you are obsolete and 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 you see uh, uh, regulating capitalism is mainly it's a lot about how to manage this contradiction whether we talk about secular stagnation about inequality about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know the middle income trap various enigmas or various uh, 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 again and again, this contradiction is coming back. Green innovation, again and again, this contradiction is coming back. Now, Schumpeter himself was deeply pessimistic about the future of capitalism because he thought that the first innovators would turn into conglomerates that would block subsequent innovation. But in fact, in this book, we show that there are forces that can allow you to avert the, Schumpet, the pessim, uh, Schumpeter's pessimism. And so we, we advocate an optimism of the will, a fighting optimism in place of Schumpeter's pessimism. So the book uses the lens of creative destruction and the Schumpeterian framework that I outlined uh, before, above, to do three things. First, to revisit some main enigmas in economic history. Second, to question some common wisdom, some wrong ideas of politics. So I, uh, there I am in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm disagreeing with some of my friends on what to do, not to do. And three, to rethink the future of capitalism. So let me just touch upon that because we, I'm on your short presentation. So I will do, I will just touch upon the, the three things. So first on economic, historical enigma. We have much more enigma in the book, but two that I will just mention to you is the industrial takeoff and secular stagnation. But there is the whole enigma of inequality. There is the enigma of middle income trap. There is the enigma of structural change, where how you go from agriculture to industrial, to services. So you have a number of enigmas in the, in the book, but I, here I just mentioned. Two. So uh, industrial takeoff, we know from Madison, the work of Madison, that essentially growth worldwide took off in 1920. Not, nothing much happened. You could have a kind of brief episodes of growth here and there. They would never be lasting. And uh, growth truly took off in 1820 of GDP per capita worldwide, okay? And first in England, then France, then US, and then elsewhere. But uh, um, so that's amazing. Why in, in Europe and not in China, where which was very innovative? You know, we have many inventions were uh, uh, discovered in China. The wheel, the the compass, many many things were discovered in China uh, uh, long before 1800. And why nothing happened in China and the takeoff took place? And there, Joel Mokir, and we we talk about that in chapter two of the book, very much. The, uh, uh, explains that in a way that very much mirrors the Schumpeterian growth paradigm. First, uh, Mokir tells you that uh, you had some institutions that uh, made it possible to have cumulative innovation by early uh, 19th century, in particular the Encyclopedia. You had the, the Encyclopedia Britannica or the, the French Encyclopedia of Diderot that would allow you to uh, codify knowledge and that would make it much easier to have cumulative innovation and also the whole openness in universities, which you didn't have before. Second thing, uh, you had institutions to protect property rights for people who innovate to make sure that the innovation rights are not expropriated. That came from the glorious revolution in England and then the French revolution in France. So without that, without those, you would not have had patent uh, uh, institutions, you know, the protection of property rights. So that was very important. And that happened in Europe. It didn't exist in China. And three, 
uh, a new uh, destruction. Whenever in China you had an inventor that was making a great invention, the emperor would make sure that guy would be neutralized because the emperor was afraid that his power would be uh, confiscated, you know, threatened by the innovator. Uh, uh, in Europe, what was great is that you had competition between several European countries. So if, if, uh, if an innovator would be persecuted in France, he could go to Prussia or to England, and there he, he would be able to develop his or her innovation and compete with France. So that was made it really possible to sustain creative destruction in France or in, in other European countries and not rather than China. Okay, so that's the first uh, uh, enigma that we talk about, chapter two. Another enigma is the uh, secular stagnation. You see, here I'm showing you uh, average yearly TFP growth in the US in three periods. And you see that growth, TFP growth went up a lot between 95 and 2005. But then since 2006, growth, TFP growth is very low. You have a, a big decline of, TF, of TFP growth in, in the US. And it's a bit enigma because it's at the time where you have the IT revolution and the AI, the artificial intelligence revolution. How come? And there, what we show, what's very interesting is that that's particularly true in IT producing industries, this up and down, and the IT, which is the black curve, or the IT using industries, which is the gray curve. And the, the, what, what we explain in chapter six of the book is that during the IT revolution, that allowed some uh, superstar firms to emerge, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, at all, Google. And those firms, you know, they, they spread out because they did a lot of merger and acquisition without limit. And they spread out in the economy, in the American economy. And that at first boosted growth because they were more productive than other firms. And that explains the boost of growth between 95 and 2005 or whatever. But then once they spread to all the sectors of the economy, they uh, stifled innovation and entry by other firms. You see, they discouraged other firms from innovating. And uh, so that's very much the Schumpeter story. You have people who innovate, but then they stifle other uh, new entrants, new entry, and new innovation. So uh, there, uh, uh, you need to adapt competition policy in the US to the digital era. For example, uh, uh, it's possible in the US to do merger and acquisition without any limit, without looking at the possible effects, negative effects that a merger could have on subsequent entry and innovation in the sector. So now Biden administration is introducing new rules to, to change competition policy in, in the US. I hope that those, those reforms will help uh, 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 put an end to the secular stagnation. Because you see, that's explained. That's very interesting that you, you know, uh, good competition policy, good institutions, uh, uh, together with the technological revolution, will allow the technological revolution to produce growth. But if you have the IT and AI revolution with inadequate competition policy, then instead of boosting growth, you, in fact, uh, uh, slow down growth. And that's, uh, uh, you see, that's, that's the, the, what we explained. So you see, by the way, the, that illustrates my view on Schumpeter's pessimism. You see, you had the civil society in the US, they voted Biden, they ousted uh, Trump, and thanks to that, they have a new competition policy. And maybe thanks to that, you will have entry and innovation resuming in the US much more. You see, that's the hope. Okay, so the second thing the book does is to question common wisdom. So for example, one you know, bad idea is that you should tax robots to protect employment. And there have been various studies at industry level or commuting zone level suggesting that firms that would uh, automate or robotize would uh, destroy employment. That's not right, that's not true. In France, we have a firm level and that's chapter three of the book. We look at firms that automate and we have even studies here. And the automation takes place here at zero, and you see the effect on employment. And you see that uh, uh, you have right away an, an impact, a positive effect on employment, and, and even a, long, a bigger effect in the long run. So, of course, it's true that firms that automate, robotize, et cetera, they will replace some manpower with machines. But you see, the thing is, the more important thing is that by uh, automating, they become more productive. That's the evolution of the quality adjusted export price. And the quality adjusted export price goes down a lot when you automate. And as a result, your uh, sales worldwide go up a lot. And because you have a bigger market uh, size worldwide, you have a bigger demand for your product, and therefore you demand more employment. So it's true you have the substitution effect that I was mentioning before. You substitute a bit manpower, uh, manpower by machines. But you have a huge competitiveness or productivity effect, which is more than counteracts 
the uh, negative uh, uh, you know uh, substitution effect and uh, and, and therefore uh, explains why plants and firms that automate in fact create employment uh, overall so taxing robots would be a very bad idea because you would tax the innovation that those firms make you would prevent those firms from increasing their market share worldwide and therefore from being able to hire more workers so it's a very bad idea to tax robots okay and uh, and the book talks about other bad ideas protectionism is not the way to deal with the china sh import shock uh, 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 negative growth is not the way to deal with global warming uh, um, you know, uh, just taxes and taxing capital or overtaxing capital is not the best way to have more inclusive growth. We, we, we kill a number of bad ideas, okay? And I will, we'll discuss that maybe in the discussion. The third part, the third thing that the book does is uh, to rethink capitalism. And in fact, you see, COVID has been a revelator. It has revealed that US is a broken social model, but it's revealed also that in Europe, we don't have enough innovation. Although Germany is doing better than France, I can tell you. So here you will like that one because it's Germany versus US. So here I show uh, the, the, the black curves are, is the evolution of the unemployment rate in uh, uh, US. Now the black, the triangle black is Germany unemployment rate and uh, the gray triangle is US unemployment. And US unemployment went up a lot during COVID, much less the, the German. But then the, the circle black is the evolution, is the fraction of the German population without health insurance. You see, it's always zero throughout. Whereas the gray circle, the one at the very top, the curve at the top, is the, the fraction of population without health insurance in the US. And you see, it went down at the time of the Obamacare in uh, 2014, around here. But now with the COVID, it went up a lot. So you see, when COVID occurs, uh, 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 the, the German social model works very well. And the US social model doesn't work well, doesn't ensure properly uh, uh, the population against, you know, when they need health, uh, they stop getting health in the, in the US, not in, the, in Germany. The same with poverty. Uh, uh, the circle black is the fraction of German population with, at the risk of poverty. And you see it remains constant uh, throughout. The COVID did not affect it. Whereas the gray circle, which is the uh, US, uh, uh, the, the, the share of population at the risk of poverty, at the fringe of poverty, went up a lot with COVID. And again, the German model is better than the US model. But I, when I say about Germany, it's true for France or uh, Scandinavia, or we are doing better on protection. So that, that's the bad. So you see, on the social, US is really bad, and Europe is much, Western Europe, particularly Germany, France, and the Scandinavian are much better than the US. But now, on the other hand, you can look at innovation. Here I look at biotech patents per million inhabitants. Look at the last column, 2016. You see that US is way above EU27 or average OECD or China. And if I was just restricting attention to the top cited patents, uh, even the gap with the US would be even bigger. Uh, uh, now, you see, it's, uh, it, well, that's not just for, by chance, it's because US have a fantastic innovation ecosystem. They have, you know, to, uh, only in biotech to fund basic research, they have, you know, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, that, that we explained very well in chapter 12 of the book. Uh, uh, only that, all that is for fundamental research. They have venture capital. We explain in the book the importance of venture capital, chapter 12. They have institutional investors. We explain in the book the importance of institutional investors, much more developed than in Europe. Uh, uh, and they have the famous BARDA, Biologic Advanced Research Development Agency, and, uh, 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 and uh, BARDA. Uh, which is the equivalent of the, the, the defense, uh, the DARPA Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency that was created during the Cold War in the US to uh, innovate in the, in the area of military and space to, 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 to compete with the Soviet Union at the time. And BARDA. So those are institutions that are done where you have the basic research already done, but the problem is to quickly transform the basic research into industrial applications on, on very well defined missions. So, for example, with DARPA, it was put a man in space after Gagarin or develop uh, the, the new defense system, you see, where the research has been done already. With BARDA, it was the, you start from the ARN messenger technology and produce vaccines in one year, you see. And BARDA spends $12 billion on vaccine, diagnostic, therapeutics, and other on just last year, $12 billion. France, at the same time, if you sum European Commission plus EIB, you get barely at 4 billion. 
So you see, uh, uh, on all dimensions of uh, innovation, the, the US are above Europe, okay? Although Germany is much better than France, I can tell, let me tell you. And uh, uh, so what you would like now, if you rethink capitalism, is to have a model of capitalism which has the good side of the American model, which is to be innovative, and the good side of the European model, particularly, I, I'm very fond of, of Denmark. Uh, uh, I like Germany, but I like Denmark very much with your neighbor, uh, uh, which is very protective and inclusive. Some people believe that it's an either or. If you choose to have an innovative model, you renounce protection and inclusion. If you choose to have inclusion and protection, you renounce being innovative. I think this is wrong. And let me give you three, uh, uh, at least three uh, policies <clears throat> that would both boost innovation and boost inclusiveness and protection. So the first policy is flex security. Denmark, they introduced a system that whenever you are unemployed, you get 90% of your salary for two years, up to a certain level of salary, of course. Huh? You get the state helps you find a new job and retrains you. It's a fantastic uh, uh, system for the unemployed. And uh, 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 in the US, they don't have that. So the, the thing is that in the US, you can see here, that's from uh, uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, the, the black curve, the continuous black shows the mortality rate for people aged uh, uh, 50 to 54 who are unskilled white non-Hispanics. And you see that that curve, you see mortality of that fringe of the population, uh, that uh, range went up a lot since the 2000. And it's very much due to unemployment fear, to the risk, uh, uh, the stress, associated with becoming unemployed in the US. That's what uh, Case and Deaton argue. And uh, so that's bad because creative destruction creates unhappiness. And we talk a lot about that in chapter 11 of the book. Uh, 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 you know, uh, creative destruction creates, you know, uh, mortality by obesity, by opioid consumption, by overconsumption of sleeping pills, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, in, in, in Denmark, the work of Alexandra Roulet is amazing because she shows that becoming unemployed has no, if, no negative effect on health. She compares the health of a worker whose firm is becoming uh, is closing down between 2001 and 2006 with an identical worker in all respects, uh, experience, age, uh, uh, education, everything, but whose plant does not close between 2001 and 2006. And no effect of uh, uh, losing your job on purchase of antidepressants, anti-anxiety anti or sleeping pills. No effect of, on, of on becoming unemployed on the probability to visit the hospital for disease or secular disease. And, and I didn't show you no effect on mortality. So you see, when, now the, see, the great thing with flex security in Denmark, when they introduced it, it made creative destruction in Denmark much better. So they could do more innovation in Denmark, but at the same time, they protected better. So here, there was a thing, flex security, which boosts innovation and boosts protection at the same time. Another uh, uh, example is education. Here I'm showing you the probability of uh, someone innovating as a function of parental income. So you see that when you have high income parents, you're much more likely to innovate. The left hand side curve is US uh, based on current data. That's from Bell, Shetty, Jaravel, Petkova, and Van Greenen, Q Quarterly Journal of Economics. The middle curve is from Axigit, Grigsby, Nicholas. And the right hand side curve is from Finland, Agion, Aksigit, Aitinen, and Toivanen. You see, they are very similar, even, in, even though Finland is much more egalitarian. But you see, the nice thing is that we looked at Finland. When you control for parental income, you see that the curve flattens out a lot. <clears throat> because in Finland, it's not a problem of, of, of having to pay for school. School is free from a kindergarten to university. But the thing is that, of course, uh, uh, parents who are on more are also parents who are more educated. And still, that matters a lot for the probability of being an inventor. Because educated parents, they transmit knowledge and they transmit aspiration. That still works a lot. So the, the, that's what tells you that you should invest on education uh, uh, over many generations to flatten out the curve, you see. And, uh, and uh, so investing in education will do two things. You will increase the number of people who will be Einstein's. You see the problem with in the US and, and also in Finland still is that you have a lot of what we call lost Einsteins, people who could have been Einstein, but because they did not access uh, a proper knowledge and, and, and awareness that you could innovate, they did not become innovators. So that would boost innovation to have education over several generations because you would increase the number of potential Einsteins. 
But at the same time, it would make growth more inclusive by definition, you see. And my third example is competition. I talked about it already, okay? Competition, here is the entry, by the way. I told you that entry, entry rate went up and then went down. That's the consequence of the superstar firms in the US. Now, if you put competition policy, what it will do is that it will boost growth by allowing for more innovation. It will uh, put an end to the secular stagnation. But at the same time, because you will have new entrants, it will increase social mobility because that's the big source of social mobility. And we explain that in the book in chapter five is an innovations by entrance. So you see against there having competition, more competition is good, both good, is good both for growth, innovation led growth and for inclusion. So the last slide is that the, the, we explain in the book that at the end of the day, the key is the triangle between markets, firms, when I say marché, it's firms, uh, 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 the state and civil society. You need firms to innovate, but you need the state to regulate. So for example, I told you, you need competition policy, education, but that comes from the state. But the problem is that very often the state can be captured by the firms, by incumbent firms. And so to make sure that does not happen too much, civil society has a key role to play, you see? Because of course, we discussed that in chapter 14 and 15 of the book. Of course, to some extent, separation of power within the state between executive, uh, legislative, and, and, and judiciary helps you so, to some extent make sure that the state will not be captured by the market, by firms. But you know, the constitution is an incomplete contract. And that's why to make sure the incomplete contract is in force, you have a big role for civil society. And that's what we explain in chapter uh, 15 of the book. So that concludes the, the presentation. I don't know how long I took, but <laughs> I promise not to be too long. So thanks very much. And now I'm ready to answer your questions. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, thanks. It's, it's a hard job it's, uh, to have a book with 50 chapters to explain the whole book in 20 minutes. Yeah, but um, that was great. And it, it really gives, you know, there's so much to innovation and that's what, what the book shows. Yeah, so we are, when we think about innovation, typically we think about, you know, how to support innovation, to finance innovation, but it, there's so many other aspects to it. Some which you haven't even spoken about, but it's in the yeah, book about exactly. international trade, the influence on, on and inequality, um, and, and what does has innovation to do with inequality? What I liked is, you know, it's uh, we think about firms innovating and then defending their position. So it's not, you know, it's not a natural process, but we need competition. Um, um, but then we also need competition policy. Um, one first question I want to ask you is that. You, the book is a lot about competition. Creative destruction is becoming better than someone else. Yeah, if you destruct something, you are better. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about competition. And my feeling is that across politicians, there's not really they don't like competition. They t they like innovation. Yeah, but they don't like competition. So is, is this also your impression? Uh, for example, when Uber came to to Germany, you know, they blocked it. Or Airbnb yeah. came to Germany, they blocked it. Yeah, so. So they, they like to talk about innovation and new startups, but you know, they don't like competition and getting rid of what they have. Yeah. So what can we make out of this, you know, this, this problem? Or is it just the German? Yeah, problem? and that's the whole problem, you know, the, the or when they go for competition, they think you should ban any type of industrial policy. You see, it's very much, uh, you know, uh, you first go for, you know, uh, you, you become either com pure competition, like, you know, for example, Anne Kruger, there was the big wave of the Washington consensus, or you abandon, or you go for industrial policy without competition, you see? And it, uh, in the book, we explain a lot, we have a, the whole chapter on, on competition first, uh, chapter four, and we, we explain the relationship between comp uh, competition policy and industrial policy. You can do, in some, it's true that mainly you want to have horizontal policies for innovation, education, uh, research, uh, help uh, higher education, uh, uh, competition policy, uh, small business act, things like that are good for innovation in general. But in some areas, like digital, like health, like uh, energy, it's important also to have some kind of sectoral policy. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's true that in Europe, for several years, there was the view that any kind of the, the, uh, policy like that would be bad for competition. You should just preclude it. And, uh, and so my, uh, my, uh, my, um, my uh, answer to that is to say, uh, uh, is to say no, uh, you can have a, a industrial policy which is pro-competition. And for example, the DARPA and the BARDA, 
are very good examples of industrial policy, which is pro-competition, because the way it's done, the money comes from the ministry, then they have team leaders, and the team leaders elicit competing projects. So, for example, for the vaccines, uh, the, bar, the, the money came from the ministry or, you know, the government in the U.S., but they, uh, a lot, but they, they elicit, then the team leaders uh, uh, elicited projects from, you know, Moderna, Pfizer, many, 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 quoi. And, uh, and many that you don't know because they failed. Some succeeded, some failed. It was very much competition there. So you can have uh, in the smartly designed industrial policy, which is pro-competition. Uh, uh, and that's something we really explain in the book because there was a view before that it's an either or. You can either be pro-competition and then you preclude any form of sectoral policy or you are for sectoral policy and therefore it means you, know, you go against competition. And you need both because you, competition, why is it important? Because first, you need new entry. If you go against competition, you preclude new entry. But also because we explained there is what we call an escape competition effect. If you compete with me, I will innovate more to do better than you. That is a very strong force. That's a very, you, if you want to innovate, particularly at the technological frontier, competition becomes something very important. And that's what we explained also in chapter seven on middle income contract. <laughs> <laughs> but but then let's come to, to innovation policy and let's start with that point because yeah. you already mentioned DARPA. Maybe the first point I want to make here is that uh, you say there's this trade-off or some people think, you know, either full competition or you have industrial policy. But uh, just looking at the figures, in Germany we spend on research and development about 3% of the gross national product. Yeah. That's about mm -hmm. 100 billion. And out of this, 70% is private money yeah. as a firm. <laughs> And another 17, so one seven is university. So it's more education yeah, research. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so you could make the argument, most of innovation is done inside firms. So the best innovation policy is to let them make, you know, let them do their job, have free markets, have open markets, so that they innovate yeah, inside yeah, the firms. Yeah. So yeah. why, you know, wh yeah. what is and the argument? We explain that a bit. Yeah, we explain yeah. that a bit in chapter 10 of the book, <laughs> where we explain that research is a multi-stage process. You first have basic research. And so basic research is something that has to be very open. You see, we're in universities, we need to talk to each other. So if we didn't have well-funded universities, in France, the problem is that uh, researchers are very badly paid. The equipment is terrible, and it's underfunded. So the good people, they go to the US or Germany because they cannot do proper work in France. It's very sad, or they go to China now. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, and because the basic stage of research has to be open and free, you see? So when you, when you the, an idea becomes more mature, then it gets into becoming private sector idea. You see what I mean? And there it has to be more focused and more proprietary. But there is always a stage on the research project which has to be very open. That stage is not naturally done in firms. You see, some firms do a bit of that, but it's mostly done in universities or research centers. You, you see, ARN Messenger, not obviously would have been invented in a firm. You see what I mean? It was invented in a lab, in a private public thing. Mm -hmm. And then firms developed ARN Messenger. So, you see those, so that's what we explain in chapter uh, in chapter 10 of the book, you see, that's, uh, that's why you can't do everything. And the, the, I, there are many uh, respects in which the state can help. First, at the basic research stage. Although it's true that part of the basic research itself in the US is financed through sponsors, uh, like the uh, World Youth Medical Institute. And I know the, about the Volkswagen Stiftung. Eh? Uh, oh, we yeah. don't have the equivalent of Volkswagen Stiftung in France, unfortunately. They are great people. I, I interacted a lot with them. Oh. They are very good people. Bon. But, uh, 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 so, so you, but you see, you need the state still, the state funding. Bon. Yeah. Then, uh, uh, to set up venture capital, uh, you, you know, the state can play a role. For example, if you change a bit your retirement system, you make it more capitalization. That would help uh, emergence of institutional investors that you need. Uh, there is also the research tax credit. We discuss in chapter 10, uh, in chapter 12, how to design or not design research tax credit. We, th we think, for example, in France, the way it's done is to help many of the big firms, not the small firms, and the most innovative firms are the small firms. So there are many instances where firms, but you know, there is a basic reason is because you see, when a private firm innovates, the private firm does not internalize the positive knowledge externality you have on subsequent innovators who will build upon you. You, you just look at the profit you make during your lifetime. But in fact, the value of your research is forever. But the problem is that, of course, at some moment you will have creative destruction against yourself and other people will get the rent. And that's why you need public involvement as well. You see, the, if you cannot leave everything to the private because you have this uh, knowledge externality. 
But the whole thing is how to govern the support. So it has to be support to basic research. It has to be support to venture capital and insurance an investment. It has to be the uh, smartly done in the research tax credit. And, and it had to be this DARPA and BARDA, which also can play a big role. Because BARDA and DARPA, you see, the problem is that the, it's a coordination problem there. You know, you need to go, if you want to say, I can produce vaccine in one year, you need to coordinate actors and resources. Uh, uh, it won't happen bottom-up. You, you need coordination. And that's where DARPA and BARDA. And in fact, Dietmar was in charge of setting up the DARPA and BARDA in Germany. And uh, I tell Macron, well, talk to Dietmar and do the same in France. And maybe we could do one together. <laughs> but let me just... Yeah, no, that I'm was, serious. I'm before, serious. No, before we... Let me, let me just come to this point. So, okay, I see first thing is basic research, and that's a good recommendation to all gov politicians listening. We need more money for yeah. basic research. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. But, no, but... And then you say we, we also have to help, in particular, the small firms. And we have many instruments in our innovation policy, yeah. like, you say, the tax credit, um, yeah, and the Small Business Act, the Small Business Act, very important to ensure, to make sure that firms can sustain R&D uh, over the business cycle. If you are in a world with perfect credit markets, there will be no problem yeah. because they could always borrow up to the net present value of their profits, of their future profits. But because we have credit market imperfection, they suffer from the cycle and the Small Business Act helps firms maintain R&D efforts over the cycle. So that's another tool that the state has. Yeah, and there, there are two things in our innovation policy which I think came new in, in recent years and one you already mentioned, that's um, the focus on agencies. So yeah. we have DARPA, which yeah. is uh, an agency famous in the United States for yeah. defense yeah. research. Yeah, mm. actually it's interesting that we all think it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's a forebuild, it's something to follow because it was basically in initially for defense, you know, it's a defense yeah, agency. Exactly. Yeah? And in Germany... And then it came from energy, then they did the energy ARPA, and yeah. then they did a barda. Yes, that's right. And in Germany, we have uh, the new agentur, which is called a, a Jump Innovation, Sprung Agentur. I see. And exactly. Dietmar, is Dietmar Haarhoff, he's a, the, the, he used to be yeah. at the ZDW, he's a professor in, in Munich at the Max Planck Institute. Yeah. Yeah. And he recommended that as part of uh, his job at yeah. the uh, yeah. Export Commission. Um, but yeah. uh, so, uh, and, and he recommends we need many more agencies. Actually, we need not the ministry, but we need agencies which plan, promote and coordinate research. And yeah. it, it seems to be it's a disempowerment of the bureaucracy rather than, yeah. you know, yeah. it is, it's, uh, but uh, so what is, you know, you think agency is the way to go to support research because they are flexible, small and they can respond better? Would that no, I, I, well, I mean, they can, play, they play, yeah, I think uh, Ministry of Research in France is not very useful. I mean, I can say, uh, I don't know in your country, uh, but I don't want to say that, you know, maybe they will quote me and say, well, what have you said? Uh, but uh, by experience, they are not great. Uh, <laughs> you need a ministry of universities. But uh, yeah, for, for I, I think well-governed agencies can be good, but they, it all depends on the governance, of course. You need to have go good governance of agencies. But I think uh, some few agencies smartly govern uh, can be uh, can be very effective. No, actually, I, uh, I'm so we also have our ministry for research, and they do a lot for research, and they're financing many research institutes. Yeah, yeah. And one argument, which is, I, so we have to learn how good our German agency Sprungagentur yeah. will be. We had, yeah. you know, the head we had here at the ZEW, and we, we had a nice chat. Or Irene Bercheck spoke to him. But one thing he complained is that because he's a government agency, he still has to obey the government rules. So he can't just invest in companies because that would be also, you know, it would be government investing in companies and then you have to be non-discriminatory, you have to be good reasons to go there. Uh, and, but, and but, so but, you, but that's where the DARPA is a good model because the way the DARPA does is that you have uh, team leaders for three years yeah. and the team leader has full, uh, full freedom. And he can, he can start a public-private partnership, he can do whatever he wants and he's judged on the results. We want you to achieve this mission. We don't care how you get there. Yeah. So the mission is well defined. Vaccines. Yeah. The way you get there, you, you decide. No, that's right. I, I, you know, it sounds it's good, a mission. but I wonder whether that's, you know, you can do that in the United States, but it's hard to do it in Europe. Yeah, so well, we have state aid control in Europe. You don't have yeah, state aid control in the United yeah, States. That's why, the, but Mrs. Vestager seems to be more open. I mean, I think you have to explain that the 
uh, if it's done in the DARPA way, you should accept the sectoral state. You should be much more, you know, not uh, dogmatic, uh, exante legalistic, but to be uh, empirical exposed. Okay, you do your thing, and I will judge if competition went down or didn't go down. Exposed. If I saw competition went down, uh, uh, then I will tell you. But if you manage and competition doesn't go down, fine. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So you should move from an exante legalistic approach to an exposed empirical approach. Yeah. Well, actually, we have in, in Germany this new real labor, so real yeah, labs. Yeah. It's co orchestrated by the Ministry for yeah. Economic Affairs, and that goes in that direction. So you yeah, can yeah. test something out and then yeah. you evaluate. Now we can evaluate, exactly. So we need an agency as part of a real labor, as a laboratory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. right. exactly. Okay, exactly. so one, one new thing is this focus on agencies. The other new thing, it seems to me, is the focus on mission-oriented approach. Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah. Mariana Mazzucato is saying. Yeah. She's pushing that the European Commission yeah. is going that direction. Yeah. It seems to me you are also thinking about, you know, it's good to have you know, a vertical relation, you have a mission like pharmaceutical research. But I believe also in horizontal. You see the difference with, I don't know, we look, I like Mariana, she was a colleague at UCL and I, I have no problem. Uh, uh, but you see in, in the paper, I, I, I also first say that there is a lot of horizontal policies that you can have on, on innovation. I mentioned them to you, okay? Yeah. Uh, Education is very important. Higher education, very important. That's a, you know, you can do whatever you want. If you, if you don't have a good education base, you don't go very far. So education policy is very, very important. And there is recent work by my colleague, Gufu Gaxigit, showing the importance of education policy. It's the primary policy education before mm -hmm. R&D subsidies, okay? So you can have a whole, there is a lot of horizontal thing you can do. Education, research, small business act, uh, competition policy, all that is very important. And then you are in some areas uh, which you deem important, like health, like energy, like digital, you can uh, defense uh, uh, where we need to have a vertical because the China and the US are doing and we need to be there. Uh, uh, but we can do it in a way that preserves competition. And th that's my way of looking at things, you see? But I don't go, because some people advocate missions, but they, they disregard the role of competition. You see, I'm, I'm not a data, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a competition guy. I'm very different from Danny Rodrigue, from other people I like very much, but they are not pro-competition people. I'm very much pro-competition and free trade, very much so. But still, I believe that you can have good governance in some areas of vertical policies, and that would be competition friendly and still be important to when you have to coordinate resources. And I think it's very important to have a theory behind. I think, I think you know, that, that's why this book is very much about theory dialogue, in dialogue with empirics back and forth continuously. That's the, that's the essence mm -hmm. of the book. Mm -hmm. It's theory in dialogue with empirics, yeah. Yeah. back and forth. Yeah. But if you say, actually, that's what also our expert commission, the EFI, was supposing to have a mission-oriented yeah. approach with a lot of competition in it. But if the mission becomes narrower and narrower, it's much harder to have competition. Yeah. So we have this saying of you have to be technology neutral so that you have you know competition going on. But so if you have missions, first of all, who creates that mission? Yeah. Who is you know who's the brain who says that's the way to go? Yeah. And and then if you if you if you are too narrow in the way to go, then it's you know then you won't have competition. Yeah. So so how is you know how, how do you no, strike the, the right balance? Yeah. So I think the thing would be to say, have a simple objectives, well, vaccine in one year, uh, catch up, invent, you know, that kind of products, you see what I mean? And, and then have, so there is very interesting work there, by the way, on the evolution of DARPA, which was, to, which became more bottom up uh, over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Van Rinen has very interesting work on that, okay. which I recommend you to read, which is very recent, uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, and so you can improve the governance of these DAPAs to avoid what you say, to mm -hmm. avoid that it become uh, anti. And so the whole thing is to exactly govern to make sure the bottom up part is very much there. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I agree. Actually, I read this paper because we had a debate yeah, on, yeah, on DARPA yeah. and the German Sprungagentur, and it's yeah, but exactly. because it's organizational issues, it has to fit in the national legal system. So which which is not so easy. Um, but you know, th th I think it's 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 a good idea to push that further. These agencies and yeah. these are the tools we have. Uh, have a look at the results. If I look at Germany and France, for example, yeah. we have we are not so good at unicorns. Yeah, we have only uh, the, you know a few unicorns in Germany, and, and I think France is doing slightly better on the startup scene as Germany. Yeah, yeah but, but the problem with the startups is that you know they don't grow in France. You see that uh, they go elsewhere to grow. 
Yeah. But that's Pfizer. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Pfizer should have been purely German or purely European, and it had to be partly American. Yeah. That's the drama. That summarizes the challenge we have to, 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 to meet. Yeah. But, but so you how come we can have the next Pfizer entirely European? Yeah. And, and how do we do it? Well, but that's right. We have to do all what we mentioned. All the ecosystem of innovation has to improve okay. at the European level to make sure that the future of Pfizer will not have to go to the US to, mm -hmm. to uh, you know, to accomplish, to be, to be, uh, to, uh, to lead to the exact to the production of vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's you, you're right. There are many issues which have to be solved, but uh, I think the point is very well taken. The growth of firms. We have started. They don't right. grow. They can. They don't grow. That's right. They are founded in Europe, but they don't grow. But they don't yeah. grow because they don't have the finance. Because the venture capital is not there. The investor is not there. The, you know, the, the, I was in Boston. I, I spent 30 years of my life in Boston. Okay, in Cambridge, Mass. At Harvard, and you know. Uh, uh, The, the, I, there were several consuls, you know, consulates of France there, but they, their main jobs was to welcome startups from France who were looking for ways to grow and could not do it in France. That was his main, their main job was to do that. Yeah, no, I agree. That's, I think it's a real problem. And I will come back to the yeah. data of the United States. We are really doing bad right. in comparison. Exactly. But, but one, you know, pushing you a little bit, uh, I, I've seen the data of France. They are, uh, France is investing two percent of GDP for research and development, Germany is 3%. Yeah, yeah so but why it's much worse than that. It's much worse than that. It's badly spent. I mean, France spends little, but also the research is very badly governed. Uh, the, it's all inefficient quoi, elsewhere, everywhere. Quoi. You are much more efficient than we are. So and, I'm and, uh, <laughs> and you saw, you know, the chapter 13, when I compare France and Germany from anti-COVID products, you know, it was very interesting at the time of COVID, we were lacking respirators in France. We were lacking, lacking tests. And we were lacking masks. And I looked at the export and imports of those products in France versus Germany. Early 2000s, Germany and France are almost the same. You're a bit better than we are. And by 2017, you are way better than we are. And you have a surplus of 20 billion euros in those products. We have zero surplus. Hmm. And you grew with imports and exports. You didn't do price wars to get there. You invested in innovation. And we didn't. We, we outsourced. And so that's, and we realized that it was not just for uh, pharma, for biotech, it was true in France for all sectors, except nuclear and aircraft, where we are good. And the rest, we, we lost in innovation. And as a result, we lost market, market share worldwide in, in, in the trade. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and you see, that's, that's the important thing. And you found ways to, to promote, to make sure you don't outsource too much, you keep production in Germany. It's not just the R&D. You have a very good system, you know, uh, of education, which is very much intertwined with enterprise sector, which we don't have in France, which allows you to control many more stages of the production or the value chain in mm. Germany, whereas we outsource everything from France. Mm. You see, that I could go on and on. Why you manage so well to, uh, to, you know, to preserve control of value chains in many sectors much better than we did. Mm. And it's not just R&D subsidies. It's a, a better education system. It's also a, a much better, uh, you know, uh, uh, dialogue system, social dialogue in Germany than in France. You have co-management co between unions and uh, employers. We don't have that. We have a, a, a distrust in France, very much class struggle culture. Uh, uh, all that uh, uh, excessive taxation in France, all those things encouraged firms to outsource. For example, we have a crazy thing in France called uh, uh, impôt de production production tax. I mean, even if I make zero profit, I have to pay a tax on my inputs. This is absurd. Only in France this exists. Yeah. And if I want to remove that, Piketty says, ah, oh, don't do this, <laughs> you know. That's, that we want just France to become like Germany on taxes, or so, like uh, Denmark, or like Sweden. Okay, Because what the West firms leave, don't they go away. Don't want to push you too much on France, but the question was that Macron did not listen to you, so why did he not no, listen? No, he, he, he did listen to me. He did listen. No, he listened because now we have the flat tax on capital income. Yeah, no, that's We right. have the flat tax on capital income, and we reduce production tax. 
Uh, it's yeah. not yet zero, That's but right. he reduced production tax. But actually, let me so, say so. So that, that part we I was uh, we were around. Yeah. That that you know our view on France is more positive than your view. It seems to be uh, your education system is you know uh, there's so many great academics from France like in our field economics. Yeah, because they go to grandes écoles. That's right. You know, it's, uh, the problem biology. is that they go to grandes écoles, but there are very few people in grandes écoles. Most yeah. people go, uh, go elsewhere and they go nowhere. Yeah, but innovation is at the top. Yeah, and and you say you know you have strong like the Nobel prizes in in biology. These are many French people are involved into it. Yeah. So, so you have. I think one difference really is that what I learned here. Also, I'm in Baden-Württemberg here, so yeah. we have a strong yeah. automobile industry, and it's the it's the interaction between um, business, actually many yeah. small business, exactly. and, and research institutes and and exactly. you know universities, and and yeah. that interaction is really you know it's it's part of it's the strengths we have. Yeah, yeah and so. also the problem is that in France you have many smart people. They don't go to the grandes écoles. You know the grandes écoles is very small, and they are lost. And you have many smart people. There is no second chance in the French system. Okay. You see, there are those who pass the Darwinian test, but there are many smart people who fail the contest to enter the Grandes Écoles. Mm -hmm. And they are in the French system, they are dead. In okay. another system, they would have been given a second chance. Yeah. So that so has to be rethought. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's a good point. And, you know, it also stresses how important yeah. education is. Let me come to one exactly. point. You know, we have 10 more minutes, which, which it's in your book. And I, I, I thought that was really interesting is that, you know, innovation and social issues, inequality. Yeah. And you yeah. make, yeah. Uh, you have good data showing that if, if, it's, if there are more innovation, it leads to a larger share of the top 1%. Yes. You know, in, in society, yes. and that was the point Piketty is making, you know, the top 1%, yes. they have more income, yes. they have more wealth, and that increases. But what you also show, among the other 99%, innovation yeah. does not do more inequality. No. Yeah. No. So it's yeah. really, it's a 1% issue, this innovation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so my, own view, uh, in, uh, my view in the book and uh, in my, with my research and all that is to say, well, you know, it's true that innovation increases the share of income of the top 1% because innovators and people who work with them, they, they get runs, they get the innovation runs. But on the other hand, I know that uh, innovation is associated with creative destruction, which means in fact that, you know, in creative destruction means that you have new entrants coming and that creates social mobility. And because innovation has this double aspect of in creating runs, but creating social mobility, the effect on overall inequality on the Gini, for example, is not there. There is no, it does not increase the Gini. Whereas lobbying, lobbying is another source of top income inequality, but lobbying reduces entry because you lobby, uh, uh, existing firms lobby with government to prevent new entry. So lobbying reduces growth because it prevents new entry, but it reduces social mobility. And therefore, it increases not only top income inequality, but also global inequality. That's why I say, don't treat Steve Jobs like Carlos Slim. Steve Jobs, became, now he's dead, but he became rich by inventing Apple. Uh, Carlos Slim, is Mex a Mexican uh, investor, and became rich by uh, lobbying, by you know, being at the head of Telmex, which is a non-regulated private monopoly. So those are very different animals. You should not treat them the same way. I, 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 I respect Piketty, but in his world, uh, uh, he does not distinguish between Carlos Slim and Steve Jobs. He's thinking that uh, there are only, only uh, Carlos Slims in this world. And you have to be very careful. Alors, it doesn't mean that even on a Steve Jobs, on anybody who becomes rich through innovation, you should do nothing. But you should not prevent people from becoming rich from innovation. Mm -hmm. But make sure they don't use their wealth to prevent subsequent innovation. And that's the way we, we are Schumpeterian. You see what I mean? I don't mind, for example, in Sweden, you have uh, the Mr. Skype, you know, the guy who invented Skype, he became very rich. I don't mind that guy being rich. And that, by the way, but what was important is that in Sweden, he could not use his wealth to prevent competition, to lobby, to, in order to prevent new entry, new competition, or in, uh, to lobby to, to, to um, bias the political uh, contest in Sweden. You know, you have very mm -hmm. strict rules for political uh, the campaigns, for financing political campaigns. You have very strict competition policy. And that's why a rich person in Sweden does not prevent new people from becoming uh, successful. Mm -hmm. So you see, that's the important thing. So I, f I first say, be careful when you talk about source of top income, if it's innovation or not innovation. But even if it's innovation, be sure that they don't use their wealth to prevent subsequent innovation. But that you do through tax policy, but also through competition policy mm -hmm. and through rules to finance political campaigns. And that's the whole thing that you need to to, to, you know, to put in place to make sure that the rich do not inequality and growth 
you have to this equality in order to deal with this contradiction. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to kill innovation. You yeah. see, that would be very stupid. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's, it's a good point. If you see the data, you can get the impression <coughs> the Americans are much yeah. more innovative, but much more yeah. inequality, exactly. inequality is exactly. much larger. Yeah, but one has to be really, you know, boil it down and it's it's the top yeah, one yeah. percent and it's exactly uh, exactly looking outside europe and uh, you know i already mentioned united states um, which are really it's impressive how how innovative they are in the united states um, yeah. but take a look at asia and uh, i want to finish our debate with asia you you have one chapter you talk about korea yeah. which yeah. Uh, after the asian crisis they really you know were very innovative because competition forces started yeah. Yeah. yeah, and what I wondered, and that would be, you know, our last five minutes, you know, what does that imply for China? China is probably, in, in innovative terms, the most impressive country yeah. for yeah. the last five to ten years, but they have uh, now a very restrictive policy, you know, much tighter grip on universities, on exactly. people. So what are your things, your th you know, maybe you start with Korea, but what are your thoughts yeah. about China? That's what I would be interested in. Yeah, because yeah. Korea, it was the middle income trap, chapter seven of the book, saying, you know, you have some <laughs> countries, they start growing fast because they catch up, but during the catch up period, uh, the, there are big conglomerates that develop again, like, you know, and the conglomerates not only block new entry, but they may block the necessarily move towards policies that are good for frontier innovation. For example, if you are in the business of catching up, competition is not so important. But when you are a frontier economy, competition is important because frontier firms, competition induces them to innovate, to escape competition. So mm -hmm. we know that there are a number of policies when you are in the business of uh, frontier innovation led growth. You need more competition, more, more labor market flexibility, more higher education, more equity financing. When you are in the business of catching up, it's no big deal if you don't have uh, equity financing, if you don't have competition policy, if you don't have enormous labor market flexibility. So you see the middle income trap syndrome is that you have countries like Japan as well, uh, which is not a middle income, but it's the same syndrome where during the catching up period, uh, uh, some big conglomerates develop that block the necessary, not only new entry of firms in their sector, but also they, 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 they capture government and prevent them from putting in place new policies that are more conducive to innovation, to frontier mm -hmm. innovation. And uh, in China, they, they fear that. So they have the fear of the middle income trap syndrome, okay? And they think they can, or now they believe they can overcome it by investing a lot in research. You see, they think it's true. We may not have the right institutions uh, for frontier innovation, but we, we can compensate that by investing enormous amounts. Uh, that's the bet they do. It's true that China now can, they can do uh, innovation. They can really, when you look at patents in China, patenting has increased a lot. And you can see they get closer and closer to the technological frontier in a number of areas. The thing is that so far in China, you, don't, you haven't seen what I would call Kunian innovation, you know, paradigmatical innovations. You don't see much of that. And I believe you don't see much of that because for that to happen, you need freedom. You need to be totally free to think also. You see what I mean? And there is another problem in China is that you are getting back now with the initial syndrome. You, I was mentioning before the emperors of China who are afraid of successful innovators threatening their power. Well, that's exactly what you have nowadays. You saw the head of Alibaba and being uh, now, I don't know if they put them in jail or being arrested or being because again, and the, 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 the power, you know, the political power in China is afraid of the power that Alibaba and other people have acquired through innovation, through their innovation mm. rents. So uh, 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 you see that you, you have the syndrome again. You see what I mean? Uh, they are back to their old demons. You see, yeah. to the old devils. Uh, 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 so th that's my fear, you know, that in China, they, they, they are doing extre they are extremely impressive country. I, we have to commend the fantastic development that uh, China has undergone since 1980. In the past 40 years, it's just impress extremely impressive. But I don't know if at the current, with the current institution they have, if they can deliver paradigmatical innovation. But okay. now they could decide that they would always, Alors, it's true what they do, uh, what's very smart, they send a lot of people in the US. So yeah. they free ride on freedom elsewhere. Maybe you have a lot of Chinese in Germany. Uh, uh, they free ride a bit on freedom elsewhere. Is that enough for them to overcome the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, drawbacks of the lack of freedom in, uh, at home. You see, that's a, a very good question. We, they invest a lot and they send a lot of people abroad. Is that enough yeah. to overcome 
the drawbacks associated with lack of freedom? That's the big question. Open. No, it's it's yeah, we will see, and it's it's uh, you know, the following yeah. your book, this this dominance becoming more dominance of state-owned yeah. firms in China yeah. is not a good sign for innovations. So we are, you know, I could talk for hours with you. So it's so much fun to talk to you. We are um, done. And, uh, you know, I saw one citation of you, which, uh, you know, uh, it's you are called the optimist to combat. Yeah. So okay. you are you're a fighting, fighting a, a fighting optimist. Yeah. And I think our, our talk today has shown, uh, you know, why you're called optimist to combat, which is really fantastic. And we, we good reason to be optimistic and to fight for it. Yeah. So that's good. I, you know, thanks a lot to you. I, I thank also our supporters, the ZDW supporting group or further guys for financing this event. So thanks at all. And I would like to mention that in October, 25th of October, we have our next guest, which will be Professor Harbert. And he's the president of our federal institutional court. So he will come here and that will be our next evening. So please, uh, to all the visitors, thanks for joining tonight. And, um, you know, Philip, it's thanks a, a lot, Philip Aguillon, thanks for presenting and discussing. It was really fun to talk to you and yes. hope to see you and hope to see all the visitors the next time. So <laughs> Bye bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thanks. Lovely. <laughs>